out of practice. Would, uh, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 22? I thought I had my Bible installed on the uh, <coughs> device here, but apparently I don't. So I'll have to read from these. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 22. There was in the days of Herod, no, sorry. Yeah, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord the blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his divisions, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord and their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day those things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed. To his own house. That's as far as we're going to read this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will be our guide and teacher today. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anything here for us that we ought to obey, anything that we need to repent of, Lord, we pray that you'll bring it to our attention. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's say that, spiritually speaking, you are as dry as the desert. There's no vitality to your spiritual life. Your prayers go unanswered. It feels as if your prayers are useless. Sermons that you hear are boring. There seems to be no inspiration to anything that you hear from your leaders. No sense of that new life that you once experienced when you first came to faith. You were once really excited about the possibility of the Lord's coming, but now it brings more yawning than excitement. And there seems to be no let-up to the suffering. And the years feel like centuries. Time seems to be going so slow. That's what it felt like to the children of Israel just before Jesus was born to most people. These people were waiting. They were hoping and longing for the Messiah to finally come. Their hope was almost gone. They were in despair. There were plenty of splinter parties in Judaism in those days, and there were uprisings, there were rebellions, but for the most part, they weren't having much success in chasing Rome out of Judea, and it was a very oppressive time. Any 
attempt to throw the yoke off of their shoulders was sort of like a fly swatting at an elephant. Under such conditions, it would be easy for some people to despair. And the question remains in their minds, will God intervene? Will he ever come through with what he promised in the Old Testament? Will he ever intervene for his people again like he did in those glorious days where one person put pursuit to a hundred? Where Gideon of old with 300 soldiers drove the Amalekites away? Has God forgotten his people? Is he even real? Does that question ever enter your mind? Have you ever felt that way? Dry as dust in your spirit, one trial after another, no strength left. Israel hadn't seen any miracles that we know of for 400 years. So their faith wasn't of that dynamic that is often fed by supernatural events or immediate answers to prayer. If we go for six months without, without some answer to prayer or without something to give God glory with, we're ready to throw in the towel and blame God for being indifferent. That was exactly the kind of circumstances that a man named Zacharias lived in. The first non-obvious thing I want to point out to you is the meaning of the name Zacharias. Does anyone know what it means? Without looking at your Bible notes, God remembers. You apparently didn't. God remembers. What a name! What a what an appropriate name at a time when we are almost out of juice. God remembers. We're told in Scripture that there are some things that God doesn't remember. I gotta take my jacket off because I didn't think I would say this, but it is warm in this place. <laughs> yeah, I saw the fist up there, right? Uh, if our sins are forgiven, God doesn't remember them. Do you understand that? We cannot forget, can we? When someone offends us, what's that saying? I can forgive, but I cannot forget, which most often means I'm not forgiving either, right? But of course, our memory banks are such that we, we can't unforget something. I mean, we can't forget, we just can't forget. Except at my age, it's happening more and more. Um, but once there was a barrier between myself and God, it was my sin. And then Jesus Christ paid for my sins with his life. And God no longer holds my sin against me. His relationship with me is without that bothersome sin in the way. God no longer holds my sin against me. I know this on the strength of his word because he said in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I want you to memorize that verse. Very simple. I will remember their sins no more. Now, God is omnipotent, and some of you who are theologians, you're going to say, well, if God knows everything, how can he forget? But the actual idea is that God will never hold this against you. He will never hold it against you. It will not affect his relationship with you. So in that sense, God doesn't remember your sins. There are some things that he remembers that we ought to take comfort in. Number one, he remembers your tears. Psalm 56, verse 8. You number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? He keeps track of our sorrow. He keeps track of those trials that cause us to almost despair. He knows what we're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows what the people of Israel were going through when they were almost despairing of any Savior, of any Messiah. 
Secondly, he remembers that we are made of dust. In other words, we are made as vulnerable and weak creatures. It says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. There it is again. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. He remembers that we don't have it together. He remembers how vulnerable and weak we are. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows it all. He remembers. He takes that into account. Let's not forget <clears throat> that. God doesn't expect all of us to be like Goliath. Or I'm just like Samson. I keep, keep those two confused, like Samson. He doesn't expect us to be superstars as Christians because he wants to shine through us. He doesn't want us to take the spotlight. For a lot of us, the, Christ, the Christmas season is full of contradictory emotions, feelings. My mother, for instance, who died when I was eight years old, and I barely remember her, but she was born on December the 25th, and I cannot unforget that. I cannot forget that. Every Christmas, we think of our mom, whom we hardly know anymore. God grant us. One of the most tragic stories I have ever experienced took place while I was working in the hospital. It was Easter morning, not Christmas. It was Sunday, Easter morning. One of our patients was a young mother. She had two boys aged roughly nine and 12. She had been in the hospital for some medical condition and she was being allowed a day pass to go and worship with her family that Easter Sunday morning in church. The family phoned and asked, is she ready to be picked up? Can we come and get her? She got her day pass, everything was fine. And we said, yep, yeah, come and get her. And she was getting ready to go. We knew her husband and the boys were coming to pick her up. She was getting herself ready, sitting on the edge of the bed with her little package in hand that she needed for the day. When she remarked to her next door patient, oh, look at my leg, it's swelling up. And she keeled over and died of a massive embolism. We called the code blue on her. We worked feverishly to revive her, and we couldn't. And the worst part of it was that halfway through this procedure that they were working on her with a crash cart, onto the ward walks her husband and two boys expecting to pick up mom, joyfully anticipating a time of worship. What do you say? The nurses were all like wasted emotionally. They broke down and they embraced that father and those two boys and they just wept together. How do you deal with that kind of tragedy? God remembers. And in the moment, of course we don't know what to say. We don't know how to answer. There is no answer except one day. God will make it right. God will make it right. God remembers. He keeps track of those tragedies and records our tears, and one day it will all be made right. Zachariah is, Zacharias is a wonderful name for a priest living at the end of this spiritual dry spell that Israel was experiencing. God remembers. Zacharias is an ordinary priest, very devout, both he and his wife, but childless. There are many other duties that a priest would have to see to in the temple. It's a big place. There are many things to do there. So a lot of priests, and they take their turns, and there's a schedule that they follow. And scholars tell me that burning incense in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, would be a privilege that the average priest could experience only once in his lifetime. So this was a big deal to Zacharias. 
There he was in the temple doing his duty, lighting the incense, and the incense is that which was supposed to represent the prayers of the people as they are standing outside in the courtyard praying to God. It was the pinnacle of experiences for Zechariah to offer incense that represents all the prayers and the praise of the people of God. And then to offer the blessing over the people of God at the end of the day. You don't want to blow this event, Zacharias. You want to get this right. I'm sure that he practiced his moves and rehearsed things in his mind over and over again. Made sure to memorize that blessing because after all, even though you know it weren't perfect when you're in front of a whole bunch of people, your mind might go blank, so you gotta make sure you got this. Yet the people are gathered outside the courtyard of the temple and they're waiting patiently. Maybe a murmur goes through the crowd as they're thinking, what's going on? Where's the priest? It's time for him to show up. Bless us. And then when he does show up, he makes some gestures to them. Sign language. I don't know sign language, and I'm sure Zach Bryce didn't know sign language. But he made enough gestures to them to make them understand somehow that Something happened to him in the Holy of Holies. Imagine you're here on Sunday before Christmas. You want to hear a great message on Christmas. Maybe you consider it's the highlight of the church calendar. And I approach the pulpit and I begin to try communicating with you only with my hands. It would be impossible. But that's what happened to Zacharias. So what happened inside the temple before the priest came up? Well, while he was inside the temple burning incense, an angel appeared to him and gave him the message. Your prayer has been heard. You will have a son. His name will be John. Where did the angel appear? He appeared at the right hand, the right side of the altar of incense. I think that's significant. The altar of incense represents the prayers and the praise of the people of God. God does hear our prayers. He hears them whether you think so or not. He hears them whether you experience any fantastic answer to prayer or not. He hears your prayers. The angel tells him, your prayers have been heard. Secondly, he said, his name shall be John. You know what John means? John, you know what your name means? No. No? It means God is gracious. God has been gracious. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Yohana. <coughs> Zacharias means God remembers. John means God is gracious or has been gracious. Now, why did the angel cause Zacharias to lose his ability to speak? Zacharias asked for a sign. You'd think the angel would be sign enough, but he asked for a sign. He says, after all, I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. None of she's no longer in her childbearing years. She can't physically bear a child. Have you ever asked for a sign from God? Yes. I think all of us probably have. Sometimes to no avail, and sometimes he grants it. But sometimes it's a dangerous thing to do, and in this case, it was a dangerous thing to do. Why did God choose to make a priest mute in order to make him certain? Well, the answer to that question is something that Zacharias must have meditated on over and over again for the next nine months. Wouldn't it be interesting to be a fly on the wall of Zacharias' mind to know what he thought of during those nine months? For instance, maybe he thought, why, God, did you choose the most public time of my life to intervene like this? Why, at the pinnacle of my experience as a priest, did you shut me down? The only thing 
I need to do is pronounce a blessing on the people and you stop that from happening. It made it so obvious to everyone. I was representing the people before God along with all of their hopes and dreams. Maybe I was to deliver a message of hope to them. Oh yeah. How can I do that if I doubt your word? And maybe, maybe that's why you shut me down. Maybe that's why you stopped me from speaking, because I didn't believe your word. I didn't believe what you said through the angel. And why should I have the ability to speak at all if I'm not going to represent you with integrity? I let God, you let me know that my prayers were answered and I didn't believe you. I doubted your ability to come through. God, maybe you weren't about to let me pronounce a blessing over the people because of my unbelief. It would have been hypocritical for me to do so. Because the blessing is based on your ability to come through with your promises. Maybe I was acting as if God answers prayer, but in reality, I didn't believe that God would or could. So God took my voice. Isn't it interesting that the first thing that is said about John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah, when he begins his ministry, he says, I am a voice. That's no accident that that's there. God took his father's voice away, and John introduces himself, the Baptist, as a voice, a voice to speak for God. The contrast is far too obvious, and I think it's very important. The good news, the glad tidings of a coming Savior is what gives substance to the voice. Without the good news, without the gospel, silence reigns and the chaotic sounds of a world gone mad is all you hear. Without the voice of God, all we hear out there is madness, chaos. Nothing makes sense. Humans of all ages have recognized the need for a divine word, the need for a revelation from above, a revelation from beyond our existence. Socrates himself said, all the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail, Perhaps some divine word. What century did Socrates live in? Was it third century BC? Something like that? Fourth century? Somewhere around there. John chapter 1, verse 1 begins with In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Logos, the revelation of God. God reveals himself in Jesus Christ, God communicates to us through Jesus Christ. That's God. Jesus Christ is God. And he's come to this earth. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. He's come to this earth as a revelation of God, as a word of God to us, saying, this is what you need. I am what you need. I am the Logos. And the Greek concept of Logos, I'm trying to keep it simple here. All right, Greg? The Greek concept of Logos is actually a philosophical concept that basically says the cause of everything. Jesus Christ is the one who, through whom God spoke to create the universe. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was there. And then that mighty, omnipotent, omnipresent being, Jesus Christ, willingly entered into a mother's womb and became one of us so that he could communicate to us, so that he could say, I've been where you are. I've experienced every temptation that you've experienced. 
Come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. If any man come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. There's the invitation that Jesus gives to us. There was an incident in the history of Israel when Samaria was being besieged by the army of Syria. The Syrian soldiers were camped around the city, forming a blockade. There was very little food, and the hunger was so bad that people were turning to cannibalism. Unbeknownst to the people, God scared the Syrian army away through some supernatural sound effects. He let them hear the sound of many horses and chariots, making them think that another army had been called in as an ally to chase them away. So they fled. That was at night. Nobody knew it except for some beggarly lepers who stumbled into their tents. And their tents were full of food and wealth that were left behind by the soldiers in their fright. Let me read you a couple of verses from that account. 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, We're not doing right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will, punish will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they did. And they announced the good news that the army is vanquished. They're, they're gone. But look at what's left behind. This, today, is a day of good tidings. Christmas time is a time of good tidings. Are we spreading the good news? Are we believing it ourselves? Or are we holding back? Because we're too preoccupied with our current circumstances and problems. In sending Jesus to earth to become a human, God has done for us what people have longed for and hoped for throughout all ages. He's given us the divine word, the logos, the reason for everything, that which brings everything together and makes sense. You know, uh, the different fields of study, like philosophy, and, and uh, just name all the fields of study, uh, you know, in the university crowd, they're looking for, I should say, with all of those fields of study, none of those fields can be brought together to create some harmonious um, answer. In other words, there are things in in philosophy that contradict theology. There are things in, in this science that contradicts that science. You've got, uh, you've got physics, you've got uh, astrophysics, you've got, um, I, I can't think of them right now, all these various fields that don't harmonize when you bring them together. Jesus is the answer. If any of you have seen uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there is the question, the, 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 the answer to everything, right? And the number apparently is 47, 46, something like that. It's, it's crazy, it's nonsense. But the answer to everything is Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. He's given us the means by which we can be at peace in our souls. He's reconciled us to our creator, He's opened the way for us to approach the throne of God as often as we want to. With Christ's death and resurrection, he's given us a wonderful future with him that will never end. And that he does with assurance. I was driving a Muslim the other day, picked him up from the airport, so we had a long time to chat. And he was very open. And I asked him, where is there forgiveness in your belief system? Oh, I can ask God for forgiveness. I said, do you know for sure that you're forgiven? He said, oh, yes. I said, but I thought the Quran said that at the end when you die, you walk over a chasm on the edge of a knife blade, and that knife blade is only as 
thin as a hair, and if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you're falling into hell. Oh yes, the Quran teaches that too. I said, then how do you know? How do you know you've been forgiven if God is still going to hold your bad deeds against you? He said, well, I try to know my heart. That's no assurance. Our hearts are deceptive. And that's where the conversation ended. As Christians, we know because God has told us and his word is sure. And he proved it to Zacharias by saying, you don't believe me? Watch this. I'm going to take your voice away for nine months. Where are you this morning, spiritually speaking? Do you feel like you're spiritually lost? Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Out of 99 sheep that were found, he goes to extra lengths to find that one lost sheep. Do you feel like you're in bondage? So did the Jews under the power of the Roman Empire. Jesus came to set the captive free, the Bible says. Which means that no matter how caged you feel or are, no matter what your circumstances are, whether you feel like you're in a prison or not, your heart will be able to exult in the freedom that he brings. Do you feel spiritually as dry as the desert? Jesus promised that if you put your trust in him, rivers of living water will not only quench your thirst, rivers of living water are going to flow from your innermost being to quench the thirst of others around you. Do not lose your voice like Zechariah because of unbelief. This is a day of good tidings. John the Baptist came to announce the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This Christmas, take the time to reflect on what God has given you in the person of Jesus. And may God grant you an encounter with Jesus Christ to the extent that you are powerfully used like John the Baptist announcing his good news to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have gone through and the debt that you paid for us and the way that you opened for us to be united again with our Heavenly Father. I pray, Father, that you might meet our needs today with each individual, Lord, that is here this morning, that hears your word. May we say yes to your word. We believe that you are greater than any of our difficulties today. That you are able to overcome any threat to the church. Any threat to us as individuals that would threaten to rob us of our joy and our unity that we have in Christ. Father, we commit our hands our lives into your hands once again. We ask that we might be ambassadors of these good tidings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.